So we're going to begin with the topic of cryptographic tools, and we really have to start with a basic understanding of cryptography. So what I'd like to do is go over some sort of basic and essential elements just to make sure that we build and build and that we're all starting off from the same point. So with cryptography, you'll notice uh, we're going to talk about, of course, how cryptography is used to protect confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. Confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. And as a matter of fact, when I talk about cryptography, I take that a step further, and I actually usually talk about privacy, also known as confidentiality. We certainly talk about integrity and authenticity. But I also like to add to that, and I think it's an important idea, non-repudiation. Okay, so in talking about each of these, privacy, integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation, when we talk about privacy and confidentiality, our main goal is to make sure we prevent unauthorized disclosure of information. We want to keep secrets secret, so we're going to jot that down. We we'll prevent unauthorized disclosure. It's a good definition for confidentiality. Now, when we talk about confidentiality and what are the threats, because we always look at this in terms of threats and vulnerabilities, and then down the line, we'd want to talk about mitigating strategies. So with privacy and confidentiality, there are really three main threats that we have to consider. We have to consider social engineering. And right now, that's the greatest threat to confidentiality anywhere, social engineering. And social engineering is all about impersonation. Um, and one of the things that, that you know, you'll see is that we as technical people tend to think in terms of technical solutions and technical ideas and technical attacks. But the idea behind social engineering, why am I going to spend two hours trying to brute force a password when I can walk up to somebody's desk, introduce myself as Kelly from the help desk, and I can say, hey, we're uh, pushing out some new patches on systems. If you don't mind, let me have access to your system for a couple of minutes. Go grab a cup of coffee. By the time you get back, I'll be done. And I'll tell you, I do some social engineering pen tests on the side, and that's successful somewhere around 75% of the time. Social engineering is all about acting authoritatively. It's all about being convincing. And what you'll find is most people want to be helpful. So if you come in and, hey, we've got to take care of this, a little sense of urgency, we've got to do this right away. It can't wait till lunchtime. I'm sorry to bother you, but give me 10 minutes on your system. Uh, and that's just one of many different social engineering attempts. We've all seen the phishing emails, the uh, Nigerian prints wanting us to cash checks. Uh, I was looking at one yesterday uh, that was talking about uh, from the government, I was guaranteed a rebate for my taxes or tax refund. And all I had to do was send this small amount to cover the processing fee to this address. You know, social engineering, we could go on and on and on and on with. And one of the things that I find when I do consulting with, consulting with organizations is I find that many companies have a very robust technical pen testing program, but they're not pen testing social engineering. So if you think about a social engineering attack, what might a pen test for social engineering look like? Well, might be me calling different extensions, trying to solicit information. And I'll guarantee you, if I call enough people, I'm going to get the information that I want. But it could be other things, like just I said, you know, somebody from the help desk or purporting to be from the help desk. Let me see if I can get you to leave your computer without logging off. Uh, can I get one of your employees to open up an unsigned email or an attachment uh, within an email that's not digitally signed? And the answer is, of course, yes to that most times. And if you followed any of the security breaches uh, that have been in the news, there was a security company uh, you may be familiar with. I'm not going to name any names, but they had a huge compromise. And this is a vendor of the one-time password products. Uh, you've probably seen the little key fobs with the password that changes every 60 seconds. And that's a token device so that you can authenticate along with the password. So this organization had a huge compromise uh, that essentially led attackers to disclose uh, predict or to determine predictably what those passwords would be. So it was a big, big compromise. And the way that that attack became successful, a targeted email sent to three 
people within the entire organization. This is a company that has thousands of employees. That email was simply sent to three people. And that's called spear phishing. And that would be testable, that term, a targeted phishing attempt. Um, it was also called whaling because what happened was the email was targeted to senior management. And I know that seems interesting because you would kind of think at a security organization, surely senior management is on board and is knowledgeable. And surely senior management wouldn't make these silly mistakes that we wouldn't even expect our end users to make. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's not the case. Sometimes the folks at the very top of the, uh, of the food chain, so to speak, within a company have the greatest and highest level of permissions. And when it comes down to it, if I sign the check, I'm going to dictate what permissions I have on the network. So sometimes you have these folks that are very high up in an organization that demand full ac access, even though that might not be a requirement for their job, and they may not have the skill set to get that. So at any rate, this spear phishing, whaling attack was sent to three people that essentially contained, contained an unsigned document. And what's interesting about that is the technology worked. The company spam filter uh, or mail filter took that email and moved it over to the junk mail folder. So one of the things we'll talk about in this class is technical solutions are not enough because in that company, the technology did exactly what it was supposed to. However, one of the senior managers went to their junk mail folder, saw that email, said, oh, that looks interesting, pulled it back, opened up the attachment, the backdoor software was installed, and that gave the attacker a foothold on the network. One of the things, again, we'll talk about is you can put all the technical controls in place that you want. There is not a single control you can put in place that somebody can't bypass. And that's just a fact. It doesn't matter, you know, we'll talk about physical security very briefly. We'll talk about an eight-foot fence to deter determined intruders. And then I always like to say, but what height fence will prevent an intruder? And the answer to that question is there's no height fence that will prevent an intruder. You got a 15 foot fence, I've got a 16 foot ladder. Or if it's a high enough value target, we've seen with high value uh, uh, assets, we've seen attackers tunnel in, we've seen attackers come in from the sky. Now again, this is not your normal type of attack, but if the value of the asset is great enough, that's exactly what's gonna happen. So technical controls are not enough. Physical controls are not enough. Administrative controls, which would be policies and procedures, those aren't enough either. So the idea is layering, layered defense, defense in depth. We want physical controls. We want door locks. Absolutely. We want technical controls. We want mail filters and encryption and all those good things. We also want administrative controls where we train our people where we emphasize principle of least privilege, need to know, and those ideas. And ideally, when we have that layering of defense, we don't necessarily talk in terms of preventing determined intruders, but we can certainly delay them long enough so that ideally they would be detected. So, you know, going back to confidentiality, social engineering, and technical controls do very little against social engineering. So what would be the solution? Separation of duties. So very important. And along with separation of duties, the idea of need to know. So confidentiality, you know, you'll find if you do any sort of social engineering uh, pen testing, if you experiment around with that, you'll find that many people will give you information that's critical. But the idea about separation is du of duties I can't get somebody to give me the password to the server because that's not their job and they don't know that information. So by using separation of duties, we make sure that people have very distinct, very well-defined roles and only the knowledge to complete those roles. So that helps me enforce confidentiality. We train our people. And as a matter of fact, with social engineering, the first time someone fails a social engineering pen test, they ought to immediately be retrained doesn't mean they have to go through a 40-hour social engineering class, but it does mean that there is an immediate address of a failure on their part. They're retrained. And then the second, third time, you know, we really have to start looking at administrative action, whether it's writing up employees, 
putting them on an improvement plan, whatever that might be. Okay, so social engineering, because it is a social issue, it's not really going to have a technical control. It's going to have more of an administrative control. And that right now is our greatest threat to confidentiality. Now, second threat to confidentiality, media reuse. Okay, media reuse. Whether it's reusing the same hard drive to store sensitive information, whether it's using a thumb drive, and I know a lot of organizations sort of ban thumb drives. They're not very welcome in most corporate environments, uh, but there's still other types of removable media that we allow. You know, we allow DVRs and, and rewritable DVDs. We allow um, other storage devices that might be plug and play. So whatever our media is, and I know we're not really in the days where we're talking about using floppies and any longer, but, you know, any type of removable media. When we reuse that media, we run the risk of leaving remnants behind. Um, for example, when I first got into IT, and this was about 20 years ago, uh, I started out as a hardware technician. And one of the things that I would do to get better working with hardware is I'd go around from uh, yard sale to yard sale or ham radio shows, and I would pick up computers. And you could get them really cheap. And this was about at the time of 386 computers, 486 computers. So I'd take those home, I'd take them apart, I'd put them back together, usually with mostly the same number of pieces that I started with. Um, and one of the things that shocked me time after time after time, I'll ask you this, I just come up with an idea. If I bought maybe somewhere around 10 to 15 computers over the course of two, three years, how many computers do you really think were cleansed of remnants of data? As in how many of those computers that I purchased had been wiped clean? And you probably know the answer to that and that's exactly zero. And that's very, very common. You know, if you purchase a computer, if you go online and somebody's got a computer for sale on Craigslist, this, that, or the other, chances are very good that they may have deleted some sensitive files, uh, but they rarely, rarely sanitize the disk. Media reuse, people don't think about it. But when you take media, regardless of what it is, and you use it for a different purpose, you must wipe that drive. Now, when I talk about wiping the drive, there's different soft, there are different software applications that will do this for you. Sometimes you'll he hear people refer to it as sanitizing or zeroizing. So basically what's happening is you get this little program that's just going to overwrite to the disk over and over and over and over. And that's a testable idea because a lot of times people feel like, oh, I've deleted the files. And you guys know being technical people, when you delete a file, you're not deleting the file. What you're deleting is the pointer to the file. That file still exists on your hard drive and is as easy to find as anything. Deleting a file will never be a correct answer on this test. You'll always have to go a step further. Formatting a drive will never be a solution on this exam. Formatting is such an easy to reverse process that even if you uh, format a hard drive, within five minutes I can restore it to its original state and pull most of the data. Really, the way that you ensure all data is gone, destroy the drive. That's always the best solution. If you have confidential information, don't reuse the drive. And really, uh, if we are talking about hard drives today, there's no excuse not to do that. Hard drives are so cheap today compared to what they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, you used to have to pay $500 for a 10 meg hard drive. Now you get a two gigabyte hard drive for 60 bucks. So there's no reason not to physically destroy a hard drive if it has sensitive information. Watch for the questions on the exam because they will specify whether or not you want to reuse the drive or not. So if you're going to reuse the drive, obviously physical destruction is not going to work. If it's magnetic media, Degaussing is another very successful method, but let me stress to you, degaussing is only a process for magnetic media. What you're doing is you're exposing that magnetic drive to a very strong magnet. You're wiping out the cylinders, the heads, and sectors that are created as part of a low-level format. So yeah, that's a decent step towards getting rid of the data. The best solution, though, is going to be physical destruction. So if you're going to want to reuse the hard drive, zeroization or degaussing. If your top priority is getting rid of remnants, 
then that's going to be physical destruction. And I will mention, I've heard students say things like, yeah, we put a nail through our hard drive. That's not sufficient. I mean, that might render the hard drive inoperable, you know, for somebody that's just a common user. But when we talk about destruction, I mean shredding, I mean incineration. That's really the only way you're going to get that assurance. Okay, so media reuse, a huge threat to confidentiality. Destroy your media if the data is that sensitive.